Um, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Energy Division of the Inter-American Development Bank, I would like to welcome you to our event, Clean Energy Value Change in Latin America and the Caribbean. Before we get started, we want to let you know that interpretation is available in both English and Spanish online. And if you are in the room with us, we also have headphones outside, as we will have participation from many people who will be speaking in uh, Spanish and English. Before we get started, I would also like I would uh, like to welcome Fabiana Jorge, who is the U.S. Alternative Executive Director of the Inter-American Development Bank, to come to the podium to give the welcoming remarks. Thank you very much, and thank you for the organizers of this event. It's very exciting to be part of this. Um, forward thinking event. Good morning, I'm Fabiana Jorge, Alternate Executive Director for the United States, and I have the pleasure of welcoming, welcoming you all to the Inter-American Development Bank to discuss the enormously important work that the IDB and the international community are pursuing. This includes the build out of clean energy value chains in support of global efforts to address climate change and to build a more sustainable and just future for all. This pursuit is aligned with the bank's new institutional strategy as it directly addresses the strategies, climate change and sustainable growth pillars. I will be brief in my remarks as we have an exciting agenda ahead of us starting with Antoine Vanier-Jones from Bloomberg New Energy Finance, followed by IDB very own clean energy specialist, Juan Paredes, who will present the IDB's latest analytical work on this issue. We will then have Marcelino Madrigal, Chief of the Energy Division, who will moderate a panel discussion on the experiences and perspectives of leading efforts around the clean energy value chain in Latin America and the Caribbean. Just to set the scene, I want to first underline the strategic role that Latin America and the Caribbean already plays. Sorry, I touched something here. Um, um, the strategic role that Latin America and the Caribbean already plays in clean energy supply chains and how it can build from there. As we know, many countries in the regions are rich in minerals like lithium, copper, nickel, and rare earth. These minerals are critical to producing technologies like solar PV panels, wind turbines and batteries that will be fundamental to decarbonizing our economies and mitigating the worst impacts of climate change. The region's proximity to large markets in North America and Europe makes it a strategically attractive location for clean energy supply chains. Many countries benefit from trade agreements that facilitate access to markets like the U.S. for clean energy technologies. At the same time, intra-regional trade blocks like Mercosur and others allow for multinational value chains to be developed with a regional focus, leveraging uh, each country's comparative advantages. With important help from the IDB, many Latin American and Caribbean nations or LAC countries are well advanced in their transition to renewable energy. And the region has the potential to lead the world, not just in clean energy generation, but also in supplying the world the technology needed to shift toward clean energy generation. Indeed, thanks to its green power matrix, LAC can supply clean technologies with a very small carbon footprint. 
this added value is increasingly relevant in international trade as the carbon content of products is being closely monitored to incorporate growing consumer preferences. I will also highlight that LAC already has an advanced manufacturing sector and is increasingly investing in technologies to support clean energy industries. In this sense, we know that the region can leverage existing industrial capabilities for scaling up the production of renewable technologies. For example, Brazil has seen solar manufacturing production growing in the past few years, and Argentina is building out solar panel facilities at the provincial level. We will hear about both of those experiences during today's panel discussion. Additionally, wind turbine manufacturing is already taking place in the region with Brazil and Mexico hosting with a few facilities that are building blades, nacelles, and towers. On the other hand, battery storage manufacturing in LAC is still in the very, very early stages compared to solar and wind. But we are seeing growing interest in developing local capabilities, especially as demand for electric vehicles and grid scale solar storage increases. In this regard, companies in Argentina and Chile are exploring ways to establish manufacturing plants or partnerships to convert raw lithium into battery grade products. In countries that do not yet produce lithium but have but that have manufacturing experience around the automo automotive industry, like Mexico, are shifting towards electric vehicle and battery manufacturing. The IDV has been analyzing these trends in some detail, and we will hear about that in just a little bit. Of course, much needs to be done to move from the potential to the reality on the ground. I want to highlight here the role that the IDB and the US government can play in fostering that move. Let me first focus on US lack collaboration through the Inflation Reduction Act, or IRA, as we all know it. In the two years since the IRA was enacted, private businesses and consumers have invested nearly $500 billion in the clean energy economy with the vast majority of those activities supported by US tax credits. This funding has been directed towards clean energy manufacturing and renewable energy projects and is focused on localizing and diversifying global supply chains in the clean energy sector. This presents lack with a major opportunity to collaborate with the United States to develop LAC's industrial capacity and create high quality jobs, while also helping the US ensure energy security and, diverse, and diversify sources for critical minerals. I would like to also reinforce the central importance of IDB's financing and technical support toward these efforts. The bank's commitment to supporting LAC governments and businesses in their efforts to create value chains around clean energy technologies through financing, technical assistance, and policy support is unmatched. The IDB remains the key partner in supporting renewable energy investments in Latin America and the Caribbean. The Energy Division's active portfolio totals around $3.84 billion in support of a variety of issues related to the energy infrastructure in the region, including clean energy projects, large scale infrastructure, and support for local energy transitions. 
Now, in all honesty, to really create and grow these clean energy chains, we need to acknowledge that sizable challenges exist and that they are being addressed at different speeds. To really leverage these opportunities, we will need deeper and more work to integrate the region. Latin America and the Caribbean has done a lot in terms of regional cooperation and integration around energy, including with efforts led by the IDV. But under this new paradigm, there is a space and need for greater regional cooperation in energy, infrastructure, and trade to foster the development of integrated value chains across LAC. As an example, to see improvements in the EV battery manufacturing space, we will need a strong regional collaboration between Chile and Argentina, who have vast lithium and cathode materials reserves and mining expertise. With Brazil and Mexico, both of whom have deep car manufacturing experience. This collaboration could drive the creation of an integrated EV battery supply chain in Latin America, benefiting the region greatly. Along the same lines, we have sizable infrastructure needs. The analytical work carried out right here at the IDV our region needs to invest approximately 170 billion annually in infrastructure to meet sustainable development goals, including expanding energy grids and transportation infrastructure to support renewable energy generation and storage. Supplying capital and expertise to meet those needs is an, is an imposing challenge all by itself. Beyond that, we must honestly recognize that we cannot move forward without first addressing the very wide gap that exists in terms of scale and price competitiveness between Latin America and the established gold suppliers, global suppliers of these technologies. Moreover, governments in the region have little fiscal space to make the investments necessary to begin to close that gap. Therefore, to address this, we need a serious concerted effort by the international finance community, including IDV Invest, to provide the necessary capital in certain instan instances and their concessional terms to create these value chains and foster the potential that we now is there. The effort will require tremendous amount of resources, but we are certain that the payoff is well worth it. As I think it is clear, we hold an optimistic but clear eye outlook for LAC's future as a leader in renewable energy manufacturing and innovation leveraging its unique position resources and political stability to attract investment and create jobs. I will encourage all of you to engage in dialogue and hope that we have a productive discussion about the future of clean energy value chains in Latin America and the Caribbean and the region's potential to become a global hub for manufacturing renewable energy technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fabiana. Um, now we have the keynote presentation by Antoine Van Jones, who is the head of trade and supply chains for Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Antes de todo, quiero agradecerlos a todos por la oportunidad. He preparado la presentación en inglés, pero sí, gracias por la invitación. Um, Bloomberg NEF, very quickly, if you're not familiar with us, we're a research center. Um, we're originally based in London with offices everywhere. 
I'm going to be showing you lots of data and basically that data is what we do. We prepare it and we sell it to our clients. You'll get an idea of what it's all about, but so I'm not going to bore you with a description of the company I represent, but I'm going to instead give you a bit of an overview of exactly um, as Fabiana sort of described the topics that are interesting when we think about clean energy supply chains in Latin America and the Caribbean. So we can start from a few different points. I'll be trying to cover a few different sectors. Um, I'm happy to take a question or two afterwards, uh, but just starting from here, and I see things have been reformatted a bit, so hopefully this works out. Um, that's always a bit of a funny one with presentations. Uh, this is uh, the results from our transmission uh, transition metals outlook. Um, this is something that we do every year, and we basically look at 13 different metals. Some of them are industrial metals, some of them are battery metals. And we look at how demand grows according to two different scenarios. This is showing the high scenario with what's needed for net zero. And you can look at, so this is what's defined as being used in the energy transition. So it involves grids, it involves sort of aluminium used for um, setting up solar panels, it involves um, wiring, copper wiring, for example. And overall, we see volumes doubling. And for some of those sectors that are quite small today, like um, the lithium sector is tiny compared to copper, um, those volumes grow very quickly, whereas with others, um, the growth looks more modest, but is actually huge in terms of volume such as copper, and you can see that here. So this is, um, happy to go into this in more detail, it's a big body of work, it's reports over 100 pages, but overall, lots of demand is expected, even if we don't get to on track to net zero as we'd like to be, there's expected sort of a bullishness with a lot of these different metals, so it's worth looking at where the mineral reserves are located. So what we've also done as part of this work is look at lots of different metals, again, I'm just going to show you a few charts here, where reserves are focused and you can see that many different Latin American countries, as you're all aware, host a large share of whether it's manganese, whether it's natural graphite, whether it's lithium, whether it's copper, really leading roles um, in terms of hosting these metals to be exploited. Now, again, before we talk about the downstream stuff, we've within this report done some GIS modeling, we've looked at land use, look at land constraints, we've looked at Chile, for example, in particular, and just highlighting the fact that, especially when it comes to things like copper, the land use is extremely intensive, hard to capture with data. So we're trying to do more on this specifically. But when you look at the tailings and the lands and the mining sites and all the different bits of infrastructure that you need, you actually get a lot of encroachment on areas of um, that are considered of a sort of naturally protected. And that's part of the story in Chile. So navigating that is a big part of, this, of the picture. But it's not just about sort of extraction and it's not just about mining and refining those metals it's also about moving downstream so this is another report that we published um, which is a, a supply chain ranking for battery for lithium-ion batteries and what we do here is we look at you can see the left most common is raw materials but we also look at the presence of demand in the midstream with battery manufacturing we also look at downstream demand with electric vehicles or stationary storage uh, we also look at various scores for innovation and industry and ESG regulations. And then we sort of rank countries and we shuffle them around each year. There's some changes and it can sort of, I guess the message here is Latin America does quite well and the Caribbean does quite well according to certain ones of these measures. But there are others where um, the picture is a little bit trickier. So it's not just about having the raw materials and the resources available. It's about creating an environment for investors to come in, but it's also about very often having demand co-located with that. And that's a part of the picture where it's not always obvious how that's playing out. We'll talk more about that just in a bit. So the aim is not just to, you know, have Latin America be this mining superpower. I mean, Chile's already got 13% of its GDP in 2023 was linked to mining. So we already have extraction in many different parts of the region quite important. But it's also about moving downstream. And here I'll, again, this was mentioned in the introduction, talk a bit about what that looks like. And we start to talk about industrial policy, industrial strategy with the energy transition. And lots of it is linked to this, which is, you can call it Bidenomics, you can call it the IRA. Um, and it's the legacy that this administration has left us with, with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act in August of 2022, led to a phenomenal array of incentives being provided to manufacturers. So these are all different subsidies, different tax credits that are basically made available to anyone producing these bits of equipment. And when you compare the dollar values to um, what's actually being produced and prices on an average basis, 
these actually take out a pretty big chunk of average prices. So quite generous incentives. There's no real budgetary limit to them being available. Um, and that means that when we compare it to what's happening in other regions, the EU, for example, another part of the world that wants to do a lot of this onshoring stuff with the energy transition, the US really dwarfs everyone else. So you can see here that the, the amount of funding that's made available, whether mostly in tax credit form, but even grants or loans that are made available by the loan programs office in the US are far bigger than the entirety of what's been available in the EU to EV. This is just showing battery, EV and solar manufacturers. So the difference in scale is quite big. And we talked about budgetary headroom and fiscal space for different economies and what they're able to do in the region. And providing subsidies is something that not everyone is able to match. So that's just something to bear in mind. Um, they're also much more targeted when it comes to what's available in what we see in many parts of the world, in the EU specifically. I've labeled it as technology agnostic, is that there's subsidies that are available, but it's not entirely clear what they're for. And there's pots of money that can be for funding semiconductor manufacturing, or it can be for funding a variety of different R&D projects and pilot projects, as well as more mature technologies. That's not very helpful if you're an investor who wants clarity about what's actually available. And the US and the IRA and the availability of that funding changes the picture somewhat. So there's a big factory pipeline that's sprouted out as a result of this. I, I heard we sort of talked about more than $500 billion of, um, of investment that's happened as a result of the IRA. So this is about 100 plus. By now, it's around 130. This chart stops at the end of last year of factories that have been announced um, in the United States directly as a result of these in incentives. And you can see a lot of it is for batteries. A lot of it is driven by the availability of these tax credits. And actually, when you even look at the solar portion, if those factories get built, then they take a pretty big chunk out of demand uh, for solar modules and even, I think, a third out of demand for wafers and ingots if certain facilities that have been announced actually get built. So quite impressive. And this is really something to bear in mind as well is, OK, so there's a risk with the Trump administration taking aim at the IRA. Do these all of these different incentives get repealed. And the general impression is that the tax credits that I just showed you um, in the previous slide are maybe less exposed, exposed politically than some of the tax credits for the deployment of electric vehicles, for example. The manufacturing tax credits are a little bit more insulated. A lot of these investments are happening in red states. Um, and that's been recognized by the Republican Party as well, which has recently signed a letter explicitly calling for the protection of the subsidies that made this possible. So quite interesting in terms of dynamics, but actually it's maybe not so much about policy in terms of does this pipeline get built as it is about the market. And this is where things get a bit tricky. And that's just because there couldn't be a worse time to be trying to do industrial policy. When you're looking at price movements for basically every single product in the energy transition, things are going down. And that's fantastic news if you want to decarbonize. Um, and honestly, can be viewed from a very positive angle, especially at a time when there's a lot of pessimism around COP, the fact that solar module prices are now around $10, $10 cents per watt is what we've reached, which is about the cost of production, which is absolutely incredible, is something to be celebrated. But at the same time, it makes it quite hard to have a business case if you're telling, if you're saying you want to build incremental capacity. Same story with batteries, the time scale is a bit longer, but you can look at all the different chemistries that are shown on the side here. And generally speaking, again, no one expected that we'd be around $50 per kilowatt hour for lithium ion batteries um, this year. It's, again, completely divorced from our kind of price forecast that we set up based on efficiency gains and technological progress and mostly down to this situation, which is just huge and persistent overinvestment, much of which has come online in China. This is a bit of a tricky chart to read, but if you look at the dotted line, this basically shows the extent to which um, the comparison between demand and manufacturing supply for lithium ion batteries. And what this means is that in 2023, um, downstream battery cells supply was about twice global demand. And that if facilities are built as they're announced, and that's a big if, there's gonna be lots of cancellations, but by 2025 at a global level, they reach about four, time, four times as much as is needed to meet global supply. So that's a, uh, pretty shocking numbers and similar picture with solar for example i could bore you and go through every single sector but i'm just trying to control myself a bit um 
but you can see here, so 2019, again, this has been shifted around, but the purple is 2019, the teal is 2021, the blue is last year, and you can see just unbelievable levels of investment on the supply chain side of things when it comes to PV manufacturing capacity, vast, vast majority of that in China. Um, and again, completely unexpected. Even Chinese manufacturers are shocked at the numbers that we're seeing now. And actually, when you look at last year, what's been commissioned last year globally, this is cumulative. And you look at those blue bars and you compare them to the red lines. The top line is our high scenario for demand, for global solar demand. We're almost at double what's needed. And then looking out to the future, there's lots of planned capacity as well, even though Chinese manufacturers don't usually talk about um, factories ahead of time as much as just build them. So that's something to take with a grain of salt. It's a bad time to be building factories. And that's something which has been recognized by policymakers. And that's why we're seeing this situation. This should, this should not say current, sorry. This should say new 2024 are the purple ones. We're generally seeing a trend, and this is on Chinese imports, of tariffs being increased. Market conditions are quite tough. They don't really, there's no real economic case for building new capacity really anywhere in the world. But people are concerned about resiliency. People are concerned about job creation. People are concerned about the optics of the energy transition and opportunities around that. And a political priority it's become. And that's not just in terms of manufacturing subsidies, but also in terms of tariffs. And we've seen this. This has been a year of tariffs increasing for clean energy products, far more than just this list here. But you can see the US Joe Biden's administration put up tariffs on batteries, solar and EVs. Didn't really matter so much for solar because there were already extremely high tariffs for EVs. Um, it mattered maybe for the future, but there aren't really any Chinese EVs being imported to the US right now. And then for batteries, even though it looks a lot lower, it matters a bit more. Uh, whereas the EU is much more open in terms of low barriers to trade. But that's changing. And it's not just changing in the US and it's not just changing in the EU. Um, again, and it's changing and I've missed this slide in my description, but it could change much faster as well. Um, but it's also changing in the region. And we're seeing again this year, we're seeing Brazil, not just for EVs, but I saw, you know, just a few days ago, there was another increase that was announced for the um, import tariffs for solar modules. Uh, the Mexican government is starting to change things as well we're starting to see a recognition of investments in these different supply chain segments as a priority, as we've just heard. And we're starting to see a response from policymakers in terms of lifting barriers up. And that means that that affects this. And this is a, a dashboard that we've just published. Uh, we've consolidated millions of different rows of customs data. And it means that we can start to get an idea of how big the trade in clean energy equipment really is. And this is not just for clean technology, all the stuff that you'd expect, like batteries and EVs. It's also for grid equipment. It's also for battery metals. And we're starting to get towards pretty um, impressive numbers that are sort of similar with the global LNG trade. And we expect this to continue. But the question is, how is this going to be affected by onshoring? How is this going to be affected by tariffs? And how is this picture going to change? And this is taking the same data, but looking at the first four months of this year and looking at who China exported to and what products were exported. And you can actually see that some of the regions that are most um, bullish or that are most keen to onshore and to put in place policies that make it more difficult to export to, like Europe, like the US, potentially Brazil, definitely India, um, are a pretty big source of demand for Chinese products. So what does that mean? Well, that means that we're going to start to see Chinese manufacturers, and they've already started doing this, get very interested in the rest of the world. They're in a market which is extremely saturated, and now they're starting to look at opportunities elsewhere, much faster than many people expected. Uh, for a long time, Western wind turbine manufacturers were resting on their laurels. They were very comfortable with the way things were, and they thought they could just completely dominate developing markets who would buy Vestas and Siemens Gamesa turbines forever. But now, that's less the case, and we're seeing Chinese wind turbine manufacturers like Goldwind and Mingyang increasingly take an interest in setting up local nacelle blade facilities outside of their home markets um, and um, increasingly bid into projects and wind contracts and support. And we see these red markets here, and you can see Brazil here for the region, but many others as well as areas where we've seen um, all of these different Chinese companies who now offer turbines that are much bigger 
than their Western competitors um, dominating. So that's one picture. It's an interesting one as well. Western wind turbine manufacturers are really struggling right now. And this is an opportunity that's been spotted by Chinese turbine makers. And we're also seeing this for EVs. This is, again, all of these are part of big reports. They're kind of hard to read by themselves. The blue, the teal, and the yellow are basically showing where China is not just exporting to, but it's also setting up manufacturing facilities in for electric vehicles. Um, and you can see here that it's pretty global. It's extremely diversified. And uh, the, the difference between the yellow and the teal is whether or not it's just assembly or whether or not it's actually meaningful manufacturing. Um, and BYD, just one company, is expanding in something like 10 different countries right now. And this is happening incredibly fast. Um, and again, in the region, this is the facility that was bought from Ford by BYD and invested in. It's one of um, Great Wall Motors is also investing in Brazil. Uh, it, imports have increased extremely fast in Brazil, which was always seen as sort of as a biofuel market. Electric vehicles, no one was particularly bullish on them. But now we actually have cheap EVs coming into the country. And there's a massive interest not just in raising tariffs, but also in onshoring manufacturing. And that's happening. And the uh, Mexican government is now, with a new administration, still a bit tentative in terms of what that means for clean energy. But it seems like there's a, a queue of companies who are interested in investigating whether or not they can basically set up in one of the world's biggest um, hubs for car manufacturing and focusing on batteries and EVs in particular. A lot of political uncertainty there in terms of how that plays out. But still, real interest. And I'll sort of finish around here, but it basically means that when we look at the picture going forwards, um, there are some questions about what actually happens. This is showing factory investment in all those different bits of the value chain that we looked at, whether it's for batteries, whether it's for solar, whether it's for electrolyzers, and where those factories were built in every year. And you can see that China's pretty much dominated most of the years to date in terms of new additions. But going forwards, that's less the case. And we start to see a change. And if we just take out the red bits and we just look at the bits that aren't in China, well, we're starting to see four times, eight times growth in terms of factories. The really interesting thing is, do these get built? Is this the beginning of a rapidly growing trend? Or is this just a blip that isn't going to happen because of current market conditions? That's a big question. It does seem like right now, a lot of the opportunities are extremely linked to uncertainty and extremely linked to the way in which the world is changing. And in a way, that's good for investments. And that seems like it's attracting um, supply chains in a more diversified way. So thank you very much. There's, uh, it's a pretty small share of the total. So this is for factories that have actually been built. Sorry. So the, the question was um, Latin America uh, share within this the rest of the world section of this chart, so the yellows chart, and the extent to which Latin American countries are represented. Um, these, this is for commissioned factories by the year in which they're actually brought operational. There are lots of investments that are happening in Latin America. Many of them are still sort of coming online maybe next year or the year after. So in that yellow share, there is Latin American countries, mostly Mexico and Brazil are represented, but um, it is pretty marginal in terms of investment that we're seeing globally. It could rise fast given the direction of travel, and that's going to be something to watch. We're actually updating this in a, a month, and what's really interesting to me is the extent to which this 2024 line is going to have translated into reality, or whether all the delays and pushbacks we've been hearing is just going to push all of that capacity into 2025. So a lot of uncertainty around those numbers as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the presentation. I have a question regarding the, the funding for all of these investments. Are they funded by, for example, Chinese companies, or is it funded by private sector or governments or other types of funding? Yeah, a, a lot of the funding um, for some of the bigger battery and EV manufacturers is happening off their balance sheet. Um, there is, 
it depends where you're looking. If you're looking at European and US investments, and you've got lots of private players involved um, in Europe, you've got lots of banks that are involved in some of those financing decisions. It's pretty varied overall. Um, governments, government involvement in financing projects is quite hard to track. In Mexico, for example, it's very hard to get visibility on specific projects, at least from our perspective, in terms of knowing how much is actually being devoted by the government. Um, but largely speaking, it's mostly driven by private players and there's some development finance as well, but it's a small share of the total. Thank you, Antoine. Up next, I would like to introduce Juan Paredes, who is a senior energy specialist of the energy division, who will be introducing and presenting the report that brought us all together today. Gracias, Gaby. Voy a hacer la presentación en, en español. Las slides están, están en, en inglés. Básicamente, quería hacer unas reflexiones en general. Yo creo que esta presentación de Antoine fue un muy buen reality check de dónde estamos a nivel global. Y eh, trataré de enfocarme un poco de cuál es el valor agregado que estamos aportando desde el banco para crear un poco más de conocimiento sobre este tema en, en la región. Como trabajadores del desarrollo tenemos que ser optimistas, pero hay que ser optimistas con números y con buenos argumentos. Y en ese sentido yo creo que tal vez vamos a aportar con, con esta presentación un poco sobre cuál sería la, la ventaja competitiva de, de América Latina. Creo que Antoine ya lo, ya lo mencionó, pero ¿por qué tenemos que ocuparnos de este tema de política industrial, que es muy complejo? Hay temas de, de tarifas, temas de minería, hay temas de manufactura. Es, es un tema geopolítico complejo. Pero lo que estamos viendo es que especialmente manufactura y comercio van a ser dos aspectos fundamentales que van a influir en el ritmo de la transición energética y de cómo se vayan a reducir las emisiones en el futuro porque estamos cambiando de un paradigma en donde sí era importante saber de dónde provenían los combustibles, obviamente por las implicaciones geopolíticas, pero ahora va a ser mucho más importante saber cómo los producimos, no, no solamente de dónde y qué tipo de contratos existen, pero también cómo se producen, no solamente por temas de ESG, pero también por toda la cadena de valor que se genera. Y finalmente, los beneficios son muy importantes, porque siempre hablamos de una transición energética justa, pero los beneficios, que vamos a ver un poco más en detalle, generación de empleos, de hecho tarifas mucho más bajas, seguridad energética, resiliencia, no pueden quedar, si hablamos de transición justa, en unos pocos países. Así que es muy importante para nuestra región en desarrollo ver cómo nos podemos posicionar en ese aspecto. Y aquí quería hacer unas comparaciones con, entre estos dos paradigmas nuevos, ¿no? el de las energías fósiles y, y el de las energías limpias, tecnologías limpias. Y resaltar esto que quiere eh, decir qué tipo de dependencias hay y cómo está concentrada esa cadena de valor. A nivel de extracción, lo que tenemos acá es una posición de mercado de los tres países que más exportan ese tipo de energía por ejemplo, en el caso de, de petróleo y gas natural. Y en el caso de minerales, que son los que se utilizan para producir estas tecnologías, ¿cuál es el tipo de concentración que se presenta? Y lo que básicamente podemos ver acá es que la producción y el procesamiento, que es similar a la extracción de los minerales, es una cadena de valor que está mucho más concentrada que la de gas y petróleo. Eso es algo que la gente de pronto no, no, no comprende, pero es importante tenerlo, tenerlo en mente. Es otro tipo de dependencia, es distinto tener una dependencia a lo largo de la vida útil de un proyecto para recibir combustible, pero también es una dependencia a nivel, de, a nivel comercial y es una dependencia que obviamente puede evitar que estos beneficios de, de tener la manufactura de manera local se tengan en la a nivel más local o, o regional, pero, pero es, un, es un punto importante que, que nos gustaría destacar. Y como, bueno, ya lo comentaba eh, Antoine, pero eh, estos son algunos datos de, de nuestro grupo de minería. Eh, Latinoamérica está en una posición muy privilegiada por la disponibilidad de recursos. Las barras indican la participación de países en América Latina 
en la producción global. Creo que a veces no, no comprendemos qué significa esto, pero por ejemplo en plata, el 50% de la producción global de plata viene de América Latina, la mitad. Eso es, eso es, es un dato que me parece muy, muy, muy eh, significativo. En cobre, por ejemplo, el cobre, ustedes lo vieron en en la presentación de Antoine, eh, 4.5 veces en un escenario net zero de incremento de demanda, América Latina aporta el 40% de la producción mundial. Está concentrada en pocos países, pero es muy significativo. Cobre y litio, obviamente litio, vieron la proyección de Antoine, más de 11 veces el aumento en demanda, la América Latina 36% de participación, un tercio de todo el litio que se consume en el mundo viene de América Latina. Es muy significativo. Y los puntos lo que quieren decir son reservas. En el caso de plata, cobre y litio, pues tenemos unas, más o menos una producción equivalente a las reservas. Pero aquí en este lado, si ven grafito, digamos la participación a nivel mundial no es tan alta, pero las reservas son muy grandes. Níquel, las reservas son casi una, una quinta parte a nivel global. Así que ahí hay un potencial muy grande porque tanto el níquel como el grafito también son, son minerales que van... Eh, se van a necesitar y la demanda va, va a aumentar muchísimo. Y ahora es el punto que, que, que me gustaría ver cuáles son, si, si digamos, Latinoamérica tiene los, los minerales, pero es un mal tiempo para, para hacer las, las fábricas. Entonces, ¿qué, qué, ¿qué podemos hablar como Latinoamérica en esas fases de la cadena de valor? Y un punto importante donde vemos que hay una ventaja competitiva de América Latina son las emisiones porque tenemos una matriz eléctrica con una huella de carbono bastante baja. El 80% de la energía que se utiliza para hacer un panel solar, por ejemplo, es electricidad. Y de ese 80%, el 60% a nivel mundial es carbón. En la huella de carbono de un panel solar a nivel de energía es, eh, digamos que, no es, tan, no es tan grande porque la energía que produce un panel solar durante su operación se recupera, o el Energy Payback Time, es relativamente rápido en cuestión de meses, pero tiene que ver con las emisiones. Y si aumentamos mucho la manufactura de paneles solares, puede ser, un, un, una, puede ser una contribución importante a las emisiones. Aquí lo tenemos eh, un poco de manera muy, muy gráfica. Eh, la barra azul son las emisiones actuales de la manufactura de paneles solares, comparado con las emisiones actuales de aluminio. Y lo que vemos es, de acuerdo a estos escenarios de, de net zero, un aumento por la demanda, obviamente, de energía solar, que inclusive al 2040, de acuerdo a esta estimación, se estarían superando las emisiones de manufactura del sector solar a un sector que ya es bastante energéticamente intensivo y que aporta mucho al cambio climático, como es el aluminio. Así que este va a ser un, un aspecto importante a considerar también. ¿Y qué papel juega, podría jugar ahí Latinoamérica? Entonces, aquí lo que vemos es la comparación de la huella de carbono de un panel solar fabricado en distintas regiones de, del mundo. Como les comentaba, en Asia especialmente, la intensidad energética de la red eléctrica es, es muy alta en, en carbono. El promedio, ano, el promedio global de huella de carbono para un kilovatio de energía solar está alrededor de los 270 kilogramos de CO2. Si tenemos tres paneles ya estamos hablando de, de, de una tonelada, así que no es, no es, eh, no es menor. Eh, pero en ese caso, muchos de los países de América Latina tenemos una, una eh, red eléctrica muy limpia con un bajo factor de, de emisión de carbono. Aquí están solo mencionados Costa Rica y Brasil, pero aquí podríamos colocar a países como Paraguay, como, como Colombia, como Uruguay, eh, Chile también se está moviendo en esa dirección. Y esta puede ser una ventaja competitiva muy grande. De hecho, se menciona que un panel fabricado en Brasil podría tener una huella de carbono 80% menos que un panel de, de energía solar fabricado en, en Asia. Y eh, tenemos ya mecanismos de política porque nos estamos moviendo en esa dirección. Tenemos temas como el CIVAM en Europa, que en este momento no está aplicado para energía solar, pero está considerándose. Pero hay países como Francia y Corea que ya tienen en cuenta en sus licitaciones la huella de carbono de los paneles solares. ¿no? Y no pueden, tienen o un, o un mínimo establecido de 
para participar en este tipo de licitaciones. Así que esta es una ventaja competitiva eh, importante. Ahora, el reporte que eh, estamos eh, lanzando es un resumen de varias publicaciones que hemos realizado eh, aquí en la División de Energía durante los últimos dos años. Básicamente lo que hicimos fue observar estos tres sectores por su, por su desarrollo en los últimos años, el sector de energía solar, sector de energía eólica y almacenamiento de energía en, en baterías de litio. Y tratamos de generar muchas más cifras aplicadas a, a la realidad latinoamericana. Dividimos el reporte en estos cinco, cinco pasos de la cadena de valor. Tenemos toda la parte de extracción de, de los minerales, la parte de refinamiento, refinado, la parte de manufactura, la parte de mercado y uso y la parte de fin de ciclo de vida. Y para cada una de estas secciones, lo que hicimos en este reporte es ver cuáles son las oportunidades, también cuáles son los retos a nivel regional y también cuáles son esas recomendaciones, porque la pregunta típica que recibimos de los gobiernos es cómo podemos fomentar esta cadena de valor a nivel local o, o regional. Entonces los, los invito a que, a que descarguen el reporte y puedan, hay mucha información y también publicaciones de, a, que se utilizaron para hacer este reporte, que también algunas de ellas ya están publicadas. Así que es información muy, con muchos hechos y, y números para, para poder darnos una idea de, de, de lo que podemos hacer en, en la región. Y aquí quería presentar un, un ejemplo que tal vez es extrapolable a muchos otros minerales, pero eh, quería enfocarme un poco en el, en el silicio, ya que la energía solar definitivamente es la, la energía del futuro y ver si de verdad tiene sentido que identificar estas oportunidades en la cadena de valor para Latinoamérica. Eh, Antoine hizo el reality check, de pronto no, no tiene sentido, pero queríamos ver con números qué significa esto para la, para la región. Um, esta es la evolución de la demanda, que es lo primero que hay que ver, con la, no tenemos que trabajar en oferta si no hay demanda, que eh, tendríamos en América Latina como conjunto. ¿no? Aquí queremos, queremos tratar de, de aportar con esta visión regional. Obviamente la energía solar ya tiene un, un, eh, una participación importante en, en, en la región, pero se va a incrementar a futuro, en los próximos cinco años se va a doblar la, la capacidad para generación eléctrica. Eh, la, la barra verde más oscura indica la instalación anual en capacidad de energía eh, solar. Así que tenemos un promedio, en los próximos años 10 gigavatios, casi llegando a 20 gigavatios en la, en la próxima década. Para relacionarlo esto un poco con el tema de manufactura, una fábrica típica de de polisilicio, de silicio, ensamblaje, de eh, energía solar, de paneles solares, pues están en el orden de 1 a 3 eh, gigavatios. ¿no? Entonces, lo que quiere decir que, por lo menos a nivel regional, en estos, estos son los números agregados para los seis mercados más grandes, que son más del 90% de toda, la, de toda la demanda agregada de América Latina y el Caribe, pero es representativo, son 90, 95% de toda la demanda. Lo que quiere decir es que como demanda regional tendríamos espacio para tener dos, tres fábricas de silicio en, en la región. ¿no? Ahora, eh, el crecimiento obviamente de la energía solar, y, y es importante esta, este cuadro de aquí, lo que nos muestra es, es el avance en todo el mundo. En el 2004 se instalaba un gigavatio de capacidad de energía solar por año. En el 2023, el año pasado, ese mismo gigavatio se instalaba en un día cual nos, nos, nos indica un poco de la, la velocidad de este cambio. Y si vemos al 2023, hay aproximadamente 50 gigavatios de capacidad instalada que se han instalado en Latinoamérica y el Caribe en los últimos 15, 20 años. Con esta rata de instalación, eso quiere decir que esa capacidad ahora se instalaría en 50 días, ¿no? para que tengamos una idea de, de, de la velocidad de, de, de este cambio. Obviamente, esta demanda regional implica un un mayor consumo en, en materiales materia prima, en este caso el, el silicio. 
y esto es en miles de toneladas, cuánto silicio se utilizaría solo para cumplir la demanda de América Latina. Y en este momento esa, esa producción de silicio se exporta, especialmente desde, desde Brasil. Aquí lo, te, lo que tenemos es cuál es el porcentaje de, en la línea naranja, cuál es el porcentaje de la producción de silicio si se utilizara para cubrir esa demanda local de energía solar. Y es más o menos un, un 12%. <coughs> Si no aumentamos esa producción de silicio y con ese aumento de demanda de energía solar, el 2035 obviamente bajaría ese porcentaje solo un 4%, lo cual las reservas están ahí, pero lo cual indicaría una cosa que es, que es casi que obvia, si queremos tratar de cubrir esa demanda que va a venir seguramente sí o sí en la región, tendríamos que aumentar la, la producción de este, de este mineral. Y lo importante es ver cuál es la oportunidad económica en la cadena de valor. Y como en muchas otras tecnologías, a medida que avanzamos en esa cadena de valor, el valor económico es, es mucho más alto. Si solo exportamos la, las barras verdes, quieren decir cuál es la oportunidad económica, cuál es el valor de, eh, de, ese, de esa producción de silicio si se utiliza para cubrir la demanda que tenemos en, en este momento en, en la región. Pero las barras azules son escenarios un poco más optimistas. ¿Qué pasaría si cubrimos el, un cuarto de esa demanda? O, el, o la mitad o toda la demanda total. Y lo que vemos obviamente es que a medida que avanzamos en la cadena de valor y llegando hacia los paneles, aumenta eh, el ensamblaje de paneles solares, aumenta la, la oportunidad o el valor económico de, de, de este sector llegando a 11 billones de, de dólares. De pronto no nos parece demasiado, pero es solo un mineral de todos los que tiene la región y el, en la parte solar, digamos, es la menos optimista por lo que ya hemos visto. De hecho, eh, la Agencia Internacional de la Energía publicó hace dos semanas un nuevo reporte sobre este mismo tema. Estamos alineados en muchos de los mensajes para América Latina de las tres tecnologías. Te da un una ventaja competitiva muy grande a Brasil en el tema de fabricación de turbinas eólicas, a Chile en la fabricación de, de baterías pero, y energía solar también frente a otros mercados, Brasil, Chile, Argentina, México, tienen alguna posibilidad. Pero obviamente no podemos avanzar en, esta, en capturar ese, ese valor en las, en las cadenas de valor de las tecnologías si no implementamos ciertos temas de, de política de los que hablamos bastante en, en el estudio. Y al final, como dice Antoine también, este es un tema no solo de política, sino de, de precio, de competitividad. ¿Y qué podemos hacer para poder bajar un poco ese precio? Porque producción local o regional va a ser más cara que el promedio mundial. Y tratamos de identificar en esto, este trabajo analítico cuáles serían esos, esos drivers por los cuales reducir el precio. Entonces, aquí tenemos un ejemplo muy puntual en el caso de energía solar con datos para, para México. Estos son precios por, por vatio de un, eh, de un panel solar fabricado en México, por ejemplo, en 0.35 dólares por, por vatio. Pero una de las oportunidades que tenemos, porque muchos de, de los materiales que se utilizan para, para fabricar este panel solar del, del costo, casi el bueno, un 36%, son materiales importados. Acá están, por ejemplo, las celdas. Y eh, estos materiales o los subcomponentes de un, de un panel solar podrían ser obtenidos también de países de la región. ¿no? Y ese es uno de los, de los eh, drivers que nosotros eh, proponemos para poder bajar este costo y que sea un poco más, más competitivo. Ahora habría que actualizar esto, estos datos son de hace un par de años, eh, seguramente está un poco más, más bajo, ahora Antoine nos, nos mostró cifras más más concretas, pero en esta época cuando se realizó el análisis, el, el costo por, por vatio de paneles hechos en China, vendidos en la región, estaba más o menos por 0.24, pensábamos que puede ser competitivo si aprovechamos y apalancamos un poco esa cadena de valor más a nivel eh, local. ¿Y, ¿Y cómo lo podemos hacer? Vimos que en países como Brasil y México ya tenemos alguna base productiva, y lo que tenemos es que colaborar un poco más con, con los vecinos, ¿no? Entonces, acá estamos proponiendo para cada tecnología, este es el, el caso de la energía solar, lo estamos proponiendo para energía eólica y también para baterías. Pero en el caso de solar, hay una producción significativa en Brasil, pero también Argentina, Chile, 
tienen producción de cuarzo y silicio, cuarzo es dióxido de silicio, que es uno de la materia prima para fabricar la, la energía solar. Tenemos eh, esta capacidad existente ya en Brasil, estas eh, otras fases de la, de la cadena de valor en solar, manufactura de, cel, de, de, de celdas, de wafers, de lingotes y polisilicio, no está totalmente desarrollada, pero Brasil sí tiene producción de silicio metalúrgico, no de polisilicio, aquí habría que trabajar, pero a través de estas cooperaciones regionales la idea es abaratar costos gracias a esa cooperación regional y puede hacer un, un offset de ese premium incremental por, por fabricar localmente o, o regionalmente. También a nivel de tecnología solar, en México ya hay una capacidad existente y se podría trabajar con México, Brasil y, y bueno, Colombia, México y Perú, son parte de, de, de acuerdos de, de comercio que pueden facilitar la, la compra a través de incentivos o el, el transporte de estos, de estos materiales para ser ensamblados, por ejemplo, en, en México, que tiene acceso a otros mercados y tiene, es parte del, del acuerdo de libre comercio con, con Estados Unidos y Canadá. Así que la idea es aquí plantear una serie de estrategias de cooperación regional para poder abaratar los costos y poder ser un poco más competitivo, aunque hay una demanda interna que, que puede ser cubierta también con, con, con este tipo de tecnologías. Un poco resumiendo las conclusiones que mostramos en, en el estudio y teniendo en cuenta lo, lo que hemos trabajado en distintas tecnologías, obviamente hay una oportunidad económica para América Latina, se ha cuantificado en uno de nuestros trabajos aproximadamente 50 billones en beneficios al 2050, que no solamente contribuye al cambio climático, pero se generan esos beneficios eh, locales en cuestión de generación de empleas, eh, se, más o menos se tiene una estimación por cada gigavatio de capacidad instalada de solar, se generan unos 1.300 trabajos eh, tiempo completo. En el caso de minerales, y vamos a discutir eso un poco en el, en el panel y, y después nuestros colegas de minería, en el caso de América Latina es muy importante contar con esta licencia social para la, la extracción, sin eso obviamente no podemos pensar en, en amplificar esta, esta producción que tenemos de, de minerales para la transición. Un punto importante que se identificó, no estamos presentes en la parte de refinamiento, obviamente vamos a escuchar de, de los colegas acá, pero se ha decidido exportar los minerales, no invertir tanto en refinamiento y ya vamos a, a discutir un poco a qué se debe eso, pero definitivamente si queremos participar en la cadena de valor, esto aplica a baterías, solar, eólica, tenemos que mejorar esa capacidad en la parte de, de refinamiento con, eh, obviamente, educación, investigación y desarrollo, etc. Pero definitivamente este es un tema de política pública, política industrial, para las tres tecnologías que eh, hemos, hemos trabajado es importante contar con una visión de largo plazo, tener una estrategia no solamente a corto, pero mediano y largo, tener una hoja de ruta. En una de las publicaciones tenemos los aspectos, cuáles, cuáles son los elementos que debería tener esa hoja de ruta para cada una de las tres tecnologías y así prepararnos para una transición, pero con este enfoque regional, que es el que queremos eh, destacar. También es importante seguir trabajando en promover la demanda eh, de mercado para estas tecnologías, idealmente con, con metas sectoriales, de hecho en el sector eléctrico hay 16 países en la región que tienen bajo una iniciativa que se llama RELAC, tienen una meta de llegar a un 80% de renovables al 2030, en este momento están por el 70%, ese tipo de, de iniciativas y de metas ayudan porque es un, un, un incentivo de política para generar la demanda, para después pensar en la, en la oferta. Obviamente es importante reforzar todos los marcos regulatorios para atraer la, la inversión, temas de reciclado que es, es bastante importante para capacitar o hacer el, el reskilling de, de, de toda la, la fuerza laboral. Por ejemplo, el sector de vehículos eléctricos es, es importante. Ya tenemos Brasil, México tiene esa capacidad, pero es cuestión de, de crear estos programas de incentivo para, para el reskilling de, de, de los sectores y, y los trabajadores. Toda la parte de investigación y desarrollo, tener es parte de ese ecosistema, pero tra también trabajar con eh, redes de, de investigación a nivel de Latinoamérica para enfocarnos en, en identificar esas, esas oportunidades en la, en la cadena de valor. Y finalmente, eh, 
las ventajas comparativas que podemos tener como, como región. Ya hablamos un poco de eh, la huella de carbono, que cada vez es algo más importante. Tenemos también gente muy capacitada, tenemos acuerdos de libre comercio, especialmente con Estados Unidos y Europa, que se podrían explotar. La importancia de estas alianzas estratégicas que comentamos podrían tratar de eh, bajar este, este premium por fabricar localmente. Obviamente hay inversiones de, de inversión importantes, un gigavatio de capacidad para fabricar paneles solares o la, la capacidad de manufactura puede costar entre 200, 500 millones de dólares, así que estamos hablando de una fábrica de 3 gigavatios, estamos hablando de 1.5 billones, si queremos participar en toda la cadena de valor, desde el polisilicio hasta el ensamblaje de manufactura. Así que no, no son cantidades menores, pero ya hemos visto cuál es la, la oportunidad económica. Y obviamente en el caso de, de, de comercio, todo el tema arancelario, tarifas, vemos que el, el mundo va en, en, en esa dirección, pero... Eh, se pueden generar acuerdos de manera bilateral, de manera regional, para facilitar el comercio y las, desmontar estas barreras en, en, en tarifas para este tipo de tecnologías específicamente, ya que tenemos los materiales, pero el comercio interregional es muy bajo y, y podríamos tener mucho más beneficios y facilitamos mucho esta, esta parte. Los invito a leer el informe, en el informe está mucho más detallado esto que acabo de exponer, pero quería aportar estas reflexiones a la discusión. Muchas gracias. Eh, thank you, Juan. And this is the, um, the QR code that you can scan to download the report. And if not, Caro is going to be sharing the link on the chat for those of you who are online. So I'm just giving it, I'm just giving it one minute in case any of you want to scan it. Okay, um, we are going to move forward with our event and we're going to have now a panel discussion moderated by Marcelino Madrigal, who is the Energy Division Chief of the IDB. And for this panel, we're going to have two people here with us in person and two people who will be virtual. Uh, first is Lucas Estrada, who is the president for the Energía Provincial Sociedad del Estado from La Provincia de San Juan, Argentina. Then we're going to have Nelson Falcao, Vice President of the Productive Chain, Brazilian Association of Solar Photovoltaic Energy, AB Solar. And here with us we have Lauren Stowe, who is the Director of International Market Development from the U.S. Department of Energy, as well as Paula Uribe, who is the Director of External Affairs for Latin America at Rio Tinto. Thank you, Gabi. Thank you for, for and for everyone for being here. I, I I really think it was so exciting to hear all <coughs> of our speakers before. Uh, Mr. Fabiana Jorge, Fabiana Jorge, thank you so much for the opening remarks. Wagner Jones from uh, Blomberg, it was an amazing presentation. And then Juan putting the things down to the Latin American level. I, I, I really enjoyed that. And, and this is the first time that I hear the, the sentence uh, uncertainty as a driver for investment. So I was, that was pretty clever, Wagner Jones. But I think that's precisely one of the angles of opportunity for, for Latin America in creating value chains for, for you know, manufacturing clean energy technologies. And we have an excellent panel. And I would like to thank all our panelists. Lucas Estrada, who is president of Energia Provincial, Sociedad del Estado, EPSE in San Juan, Argentina. They, they, they already have a small, you know, ensembling facility of, of solar in, in Argentina. We have from Brazil online also on Nelson. Thanks for being here. Nelson Falcao, Vice President of Welcome. Productive Change, Chains in the Brazilian Association of Solar Photovoltaic Energy. Brazil, you know, one of the giants in, in, in solar energy uh, in Latin America. And here with us in the room, Laurin Stowe, Director of International Market Development at the US DOE, Department of Energy. We met in Brazil and we were in a bus discussing about critical minerals and you know how, 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 how these things, uh, uh, conversations are very important. And that's why we have here Laurin, who also visited us in Argentina and our specialist. And we have Paulo Uribe, who is External Affairs Director of Rio Tinto. Rio Tinto does not need a lot of introduction, one of the world's leading mining uh, companies. 
So thank you for being here. I, so I think um, let's get down to business. Can we do this? Do we have the elements in place to start really moving up in the value change of manufacturing in Latin America? I have learned this from the mining industry. For the mining industry, this is called downstream. <laughs> in the energy sector, we call this upstream. That's why we're here <laughs> together to understand what it what it takes. And I will start with Lucas. Lucas, you know, you guys in, 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 in Argentina, together with some others in Mexico and, and, and Brazil, are one of the first companies, in this case, a state-owned entity entering into ensembling or fabrication of solar panels. We have been working with you on studying the possibility of refining solar grade silicium in Argentina. But my question to you is, uh, why did you took this steps on uh, thinking on on ensembling or manufacturing solar in Argentina? And uh, what do you think are the advantages of, of San Juan Argentina province moving up, you know, in the manufacturing, uh, refining and all the steps on the value chain. So Nelson, please uh, go ahead. Mm. You said Nelson or Lucas? <laughs> Lucas, and my bad, Lucas. Lucas, go ahead. No problem. No problem. En, en primer lugar, muchas gracias por, por la invitación. Eh, nuestro objetivo como provincia de San Juan es transformar nuestros recursos eh, en beneficios para nuestra gente. Eh, nosotros solemos decir que queremos transformar el, el sol en cobre y básicamente eh, los recursos mineros tenemos eh, en San Juan la mayor concentración de minas de, de proyectos de cobre en la Argentina y eh, lo que queremos hacer es aprovechar ese recurso para generar valor agregado local. Eh, nosotros fuimos la primera empresa en, en incorporar energía solar fotovoltaica hace más de 15 años y el recurso solar en, en San Juan es, es óptimo, es excelente, con, con bajas temperaturas, lo cual lo hace muy, muy competitivo. Y eso nos permite, junto con el resto de la infraestructura eléctrica que poseemos, líneas eléctricas, estaciones transformadoras, tierras, eh, ser muy competitivos a la hora de generar energía solar fotovoltaica. ¿Por qué decidimos fabricar o comenzar con, el, con la manufactura de paneles solares? Bueno, en primer lugar, porque es una forma de aprovechar los recursos mineros, ya que nuestros, eh, nuestros clientes objetivo para la energía solar son los proyectos mineros, principalmente de cobre, que son eh, eh, proyectos que demandan mucha cantidad de energía, y teniendo en cuenta que somos competitivos eh, respecto de otras regiones de, de nuestro país y de Sudamérica, eh, podemos darnos el lujo de incorporar nuestros propios paneles a nuestros propios parques. Si bien nuestro objetivo es la, la exportación en el futuro cercano de paneles, hoy en día es mucho más rentable poner a generar un panel solar en la Argentina antes que venderlo como panel solar. Sumado a eso, somos productores de silicio eh, grado metalúrgico. Hasta el año 2003-2004 eh, producíamos silicio grado metalúrgico. Luego, por problemas de costos de energía, lamentablemente esa producción se suspendió. Pero está la capacidad para volver a producir silicio grado metalúrgico y con eh, una inversión adecuada podríamos llegar a producir silicio grado solar. Entonces, hemos, eh, tra estamos tratando de unir las cadenas de valores desde, las, desde ambas puntas, eh, uniendo un, un, un producto de la minería no metalífera como es el cuarzo, que tenemos minas locales de cuarzo, al igual que Brasil, con eh, la producción de energía limpia. Ese es nuestro objetivo principal. Muchísimas gracias, uh, Lucas. Thank you so much, Lucas. And we, you know, look forward to continue looking in that possibility of the silicium uh, refining with you. 
Now I'm going to go with Nelson Falcao uh, from the Solar you know, uh, Association of Brazil. Uh, Nelson, can you tell us a little bit more of uh, what is happening in Brazil in, in terms of developing you know, value chains for solar? And what do you think is needed, say, from the government policy angle, financing, to ensure that you know, we go up in the value chain of solar uh, manufacturing in Brazil? Uh, you saw clearly from Bloomberg, incentives are key, financing is key, because competing in prices is still very difficult. But tell us what is the landscape in in, in Brazil in this regard, Nelson? Yes, uh, thanks, Marcelino. Thanks for you uh, all to to invite me to speak here in this panel. I really like uh, the uh, presentations uh, from Bloomberg and and the one from Juan Roberto Paredes. Uh, I, what I believe it's uh, it's missing here. It's a, it's a good connection between our resources, natural resources, mining resources. As uh, everybody is uh, is mentioning here, Brazil is one of the of the big powers in the world for silicon for for and for other minerals. Uh, Brazil has just a couple of uh, of manufacturers, solar panel manufacturers which today imports all the, the materials from China, or from, from the, the companies in Asia, suppliers in Asia, and only uh, assembles the panel. So we cannot really say they are manufacturers, they are assemblers. Uh, so uh, that brings me to the point that in order to develop the supply chain in Brazil, uh, much beyond these two manufacturers, we do need to develop uh, the the silicon, the lingot, uh, all the uh, all the other uh, uh, steps of the production chain. Until the time we are not able to have a local production or or silicon uh, uh, ingots and cells, etc. I don't believe we are going to be able to compete globally, at ne at least not in a significant way. And that brings us to uh, you know the old model where uh, you know, the government looking at these two local plants and seeing that, uh, you know, they are responsible for less than 5% of the Brazilian consumption of mo solar modules, the government just recently, a week ago, raised uh, the import tariffs to, from 9.6 to 25%. That's not an incentive for the local production. That's killing the market, the solar market because you're not going to be more uh, interested in put a plant in Brazil just because the, inter the, the, the import duties are high. You, you may be interested in bringing a, a solar plant to Brazil if you do have an, an environment where the solar market is booming. So uh, what happens is that competing with Asia when we do not have all the uh, uh, silicon uh, production, cells, ingots, everything, it's, it's really very, very difficult. I don't think anyone can be successful with this model, bringing everything from Asia and just assembling the panel. So the first uh, lesson that I can take from that and, and looking at uh, the presentations, very, very well done, very well prepared by the team uh, in, uh, uh, in this uh, webinar today, we need to get much closer to the mining industry. We need to be able to provide from Brazil and from the region all the components of the solar uh, panels. And then incentive uh, the, the market to use local panels when they are really competitive. Right now, what we are doing, we are just raising the price of the cost of the solar manufacturing, uh, a solar uh, production facility. And that is not really the best way to do. The second point I can raise is that it's very clear that Brazil alone or Argentina alone or any specific country by itself is going to be, have a very hard time to, um, to be competitive against the Asian uh, companies, the Asian uh, countries. So my other suggestion is that uh, we congregate the Latin America countries, I think we have a strong market, obviously, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Colombia, in Chile, in many other countries. And I think IDB may be one of the uh, links to, to build this bridge together. 
all these countries working together and sharing common markets like we have with Mercosur already in place, we could have a much better chance to be an important global player. Right now, for instance, the incentive uh, to be in Brazil, it's, uh, 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 you know, local interest, uh, uh, low interest rates by BNDS, you have to manufacture in Brazil. Then you go to Argentina, you have a different incentive for an Argentinian panel. If we have a common uh, way of bringing together the incentives of the different countries in a way that, uh, uh, let's say, a, a, a solar uh, panel made in Argentina could benefit from the Brazilian incentives, that would be much better. So those are the two points I want to bring. Nelson, thank you so much for that very important reflection. The importance of policy coordination is not like one single thing will make manufacturing happen from nothing. So it's policy coordination and, and also international uh, cooperation. Very, very good points, Nelson. Very, very, very good remarks. And, and uh, we have the mining industry here in the room, Nelson, so we will pass it to them later on. But uh, now I'm going with Laureen. Uh, so so, so you, you have a flavor of what is happening in Latin America. You have been to, to the region. Um, can you tell us a little bit of what, from what is happening in the US with the IRA? Uh, how is that helping close the gap in the US, but also beyond, you know? How could we, Latin America, take advantage of what is happening in the US? Because definitely the US is, is picking up, as we saw from, from Bloomberg. Uh, so tell us a better bit of how, what is happening in the US and how we could maybe benefit from that. Lorena, thank you for being here again. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for welcoming the Department of Energy, the U.S. Department of Energy, into this conversation. This is these are the kinds of conversations that we really want to be a part of. Um, I represent the Office of International Affairs, but as you all know, we have a very robust Department of Energy that supports research and development, uh, is coming into many of the technology innovations that are very important to growing these sectors. Um, but we also are two years into the Inflation Reduction Act, and we are now starting to see these markets growing and manufacturing growing in the US. And we have enough information now to start looking at what are the gaps in the domestic supply chains and who are the partners internationally who can help fill those gaps. And so we have a couple of tools that I think would be wonderful to partner um, with directly with countries and also with the IDB on finance. Uh, but we are pretty focused on trying to um, do two different things. So in order to get specific projects moving, one of the things that we can do through the international affairs team is look into what's happening inside the US, figure out what's, what is a strategic need and then we can connect companies with particular projects. Um, just by way of example, um, we are talking with US companies who are trying to get into Argentina and Chile um, to do lith work on lithium. Um, and so what we bring to the table is the technical expertise to help support uh, the enabling environment, what the regulatory environment that's necessary. Uh, and also to be validators for the finance to be able to come in on the back end. So we can do techno-economic assessments that validate that a particular technology, which in, often is like a technology innovation, so it may be something that isn't tried and true and the banks aren't super familiar with it. Um, and we can um, have our labs validate the technology, but also we can work with a finance institution on the back end to try to make sure that this study or feasibility study can lead directly to finance so projects can get moving. Um, that's something that we are doing in several countries around the world and we would love to do more of it in Latin America. Um, we also are doing a lot of innovation in the mining space. Uh, you may be familiar with some of the US 
permitting challenges that many mining companies <laughs> have mentioned make it very expensive to do business in the United States. Um, this has pushed a uh, silver lining to this is that it's really pushed the Department of Energy to innovate and look for ways that we can do surgical mining, uh, not have to blow open the tops of mountains in order to extract what we're looking for. Uh, direct lithium extraction is a technology for pulling lithium um, out of the earth, but not having to use large evaporation pools that take up huge spaces. Um, this is a technology that the US is leading in and that we have several companies who are looking to expand and export that technology. And so another way to get some of that social validation that supports um, new extraction endeavors because they are more environmentally friendly uh, is to bring in some of these innovations. And so we also have US companies who are interested in licensing their technology, mm -hmm. for example. Um, so those are just a few examples. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Lorin. Yeah, very important issues, the issue of suicide license to, to continue producing all those minerals that will be required. And now we have uh, Paula Uribe from Rio Tinto. Uh, so you heard from the solar manufacturing or the solar industry in Brazil. We need to sort of bring together these two important parts of the fossil mining industry up to refining, manufacturing, and then all the way down to the 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 the, the renewable energy industry. And uh, you may not know, but also besides being uh, one of the major players in copper, uh, Rio Tinto acquire uh, a big lithium mining company a small $7 billion transaction. Uh, so what is Rio Tinto motivated to look into these new areas? And more than just the extraction, are you guys seeing any interest corporate-wise on going up or down in the value change, like on the refining part? Remember, up and down is different from different sides. But Paula, please tell us a little bit. <laughs> well, thank you, Marcelino. Well, first of all, um, that transaction is still pending. It's uh, <laughs> it has to go through several approvals, uh, including CFUs here in the United States. Um, we are very excited about this transaction. We um, we this is a complementary uh, lithium business that we're bringing into our company into into our portfolio. Um, and it will establish us as a global leader in the energy transition commodities. We, um, we, we already have another project in Argentina, which is called uh, Rincón. It's in the province of Salta. And um, we decided it, it, it is an undeveloped lithium brine. It's very large. But we are building a, a processing plant for uh, lithium carbonate, uh, battery grade lithium carbonate. Because I don't know if you know, but if you extract lithium brine and you don't do a certain level of processing while you are transporting it, it will turn into water. So you do have to process to a certain extent. And also, you know, we we have uh, one of the remaining smelt copper smelters in the United States. There are only two left, out, <laughs> down from 16, and uh, it's it's it, one of those is ours. So we we do process to a certain extent. It's not like you just extract and take everything and you don't process anything. You we do. Uh, of course, we are not, we are a mining company. We're not a battery manufacturer mm -hmm. or an OEM. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we do believe that it would be great for, for countries to attract that investment. However, that being said, in Latin America and the Caribbean, we do see lots of challenges and there's little incentive for companies to set up shop um in, in 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 our countries unfortunately the conditions are not there yet and i think that countries need to start realizing that to have a, a manufacturing sector that's robust they need to give incentives and also not overwhelm 
those investors with, you know, uh, exaggerated regulations with, with uh, taxation that kills any business, etc. So mm -hmm. that's that's uh, my 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 two cents there. Thank you, Paula. And it's good to know that that there is still copper refining in in the U.S. There is a premium now, I assume, for having that security of supply. And we will discuss that if, we, if there is a premium, we could capitalize to make this alternatives viable, right? Because there is the cost gap is so huge that we need to find a way to capitalize on those premiums, the carbon premium, the security premium. Can we monetize that somehow and make viable going down in the value chain of manufacturing. I think this is something we need to 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 work. Uh, I'm, I'm going back to, to Lucas. Lucas, so um, tell us a little bit about the, the long term projections. Is, is your model sustainable? What are the really the next steps for you in in in, in Argentina in, in EPSE? Do you think the, the current model will sustain? Uh, because you know your panels are competitive in a certain segment in Argentina, but what do you see in the in the future? In primer lugar, quiero decir que estoy de acuerdo con Nelson de que los incentivos tienen que ser eh, justamente contrarios a, a, a poner un, un impuesto o un arancel eh, sobre la importación. Eh, nosotros siempre concebimos el proyecto eh, para hacer primero y principal la tecnología. Nuestro proveedor de tecnología es una empresa suizo-alemana que tiene más de 300 patentes de manufactura de celdas, eh, principalmente, y paneles solares. En segundo lugar, la licencia social que se nombró en esta reunión. Nosotros eh, como generadores podemos decidir a quién comprar justamente los paneles solares y eh, cualquier empresa minera que quiere eh, comprar energía, si lo hace localmente, obtiene una licencia social muy superior a otra compañía que esté pensando en energía proveniente de otro lugar. Y en tercer lugar, nuestro objetivo es justamente crecer de la mano de la minería. La minería es el motor, pero no es el fin último. Es el motor para el desarrollo local. Entonces nuestra proyección es justamente eh, la capacidad de nuestra planta es de unos 400 megavatios por año. Nuestra proyección es llegar a, a, a la Gigafactory en el corto plazo, incorporando tecnología eh, para tener eh, celdas de, de tecnología heterojuntura o IBC, que es eh, nuestro, nuestro objetivo de, de mediano plazo, eh, con, con calidad, eh, y eh, como bien también se nombró en esta reunión, con nuestra matriz energética. Argentina tiene una, una de las matrices energéticas más limpias de la región, y particularmente San Juan, es 100% renovable porque solo tenemos parques solares e hidroeléctricas. Entonces, si en algún momento pu pudiésemos monetizar esa, esa, esa ventaja, eh, es muy difícil que, que un panel eh, quizás chino eh, pueda, pueda competir con, con nuestro modelo. Y por último está eh, también la coyuntura. Eh, nosotros entendemos que eh, la manufactura de paneles eh, se va a empezar a dar en otros países, de hecho el, nuestro tecnólogo con quien tenemos un joint venture tiene un proyecto de manufactura en, en, en Estados Unidos, no es ni siquiera en Asia o en Corea, es en Estados Unidos, y eh, justamente entendemos que eh, allí está nuestra oportunidad de oro, ya que en principio nosotros no tenemos el arancel que tienen las, las fábricas de China. Excelente, Lucas. Muchísimas gracias. Nelson, so you mentioned tariffs. Be careful. International cooperation. Definitely we need it. But, but what else? You know, developing the value chain requires skills, maybe concessional finance, maybe 
I don't know, grants from to research and development? What else? Uh, you know, you, you said very clearly producing the lingo, the, the other stages, what else is required from government sort of regulatory perspective policy, the policy part? Is only tariffs and international cooperation? What, what else? Well, there, there are several other things that the government can, can help. I believe all that you said are, are valuable. Uh, maybe if, uh, if I can put in order of, of importance, probably uh, the finance is one of the most important. The cost of money is still uh, high, uh, at least is in Brazil and in, in, in many countries uh, in the, uh, as a result of the, the interest rates of COVID, it starts to get down. But cost of money, it's still one one uh, important element. Uh, so that would be uh, important to keep. We do have a, a very helpful uh, relationship with the Brazilian Development Bank, BNDS. Uh, it plays an important role in solar since the beginning of the solar industry. But as I said before, in order to use this benefit, you have to manufacture in Brazil. And the point that I defend is that to be regional, let's say a, 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 a solar panel made in Argentina should be uh, able to use the same incentive. And likewise, a solar panel made in Brazil should be able to use the incentives that the Argentine uh, uh, legislators uh, dedicated to, to the development solar industry in that country. So that's one. The other thing uh, that I think it's important, and it has been a big problem recently in Brazil, is the connection. Uh, many systems, uh, Brazil has a very, very good interconnection system. That's, uh, you know, nationwide, uh, all the capitals of Brazil are connected, so you can produce energy in the Northeast and consume in the South. But the problem is that this, uh, this system is getting to this, this uh, capacity, to the limit of its capacity. So it's important to keep uh, developing and uh, making the necessary uh, additions to the interconnection system so you can use the best uh, solar areas to produce for the entire country. <clears throat> so if radiation is higher up in the north of Brazil as it is in Chile, and pretty much we have the same question of uh, you know weak interconnection between uh, north and south. So that's, uh, that's something that depends on many other uh, government uh, entities uh, among the system operator, uh, the regulatory agency for electricity, and to buy and develop uh, the, the proper system in order for all this energy to be able to reach the consumption centers. So that's uh, that. It's very difficult if you if you have to model the finance uh, of, of of a solar plant that sits in, in the best region uh, producing region in Brazil. But the energy can only be uh, dispatched to the south of Brazil, where it's consumed. Uh, you know, 60% sometimes, 70% sometimes. So that that it's a big impediment to have, uh, you know, a big development. But uh, talking about the industry again, the the main point is to look at the other uh, components of the solar modules, like glass, aluminum, aluminum frames and many other uh, compositions that are part of the solar model, that's also important to be made in Brazil. Obviously, they are easier to be done uh, than the solar cells. Solar cells is a very uh, capital intensive production, but uh, you need to have a volume of, uh, of uh, solar glass and uh, aluminum frames, everything, in order to make local products competitive. And uh, one more time, the uh, regional integration can help in that in this aspect too. So, uh, in terms of uh, of uh, uh, looking at the solar chain, you need to be able to to bring all the solar model components to Brazil, uh, particularly the solar cells, but also all the others. The glass is very heavy. Bringing glass from abroad, solar glass, uh, solar glass is a little bit different than the, the standard glass that you use in your house or anywhere else. But solar glass, if you if you bring from abroad, is very expensive because of the weight. So in, all, all in all, to, to summarize all that, uh, looking at, uh, uh, at the entire supply chain and looking at the entire region, these two things combined are very strong in order to make 
uh, uh, you know, a regional solar solar industry. A very good point, Nelson. You bring the attention that it's not only the solar panel, but many other things that, that need to come in a solar facility. And you recall me about uh, these companies in Colombia that are manufacturing the steel already to support the panels, the cable industry in Mexico, the the converter manufacturing industry that is already based Correct. in Mexico. So it is more than, than just the solar cell. Uh, it's a very important part. It's the one we are after. But definitely there are other things that we can start engaging. And what you mentioned, sort of free trade of of the technology. If electricity if travels free trade already in many regions in, Central, in, in, in Latin America. So really electricity flows very nicely, no commercial barriers. So we need to look at that in, in the next stages, in the manufacturing part. Lorin, on the premium. So you see, Latin America, clean energy, our carbon content is really low in many countries. The security premium, international cooperation, concessional finance, how do we, any ideas on how to monetize that? As you heard, the fiscal situation in the region is not like everybody has maybe the resources to create an IRA for their countries. If we do it individually, it's not going to work. It needs to be more Latin America. Any ideas on, 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 on your side, how we could team up? Um, yeah. Whatever comes to your mind, yeah. <laughs> well, um, ideally, the growing manufacturing and demand in the United States would be a driver for the region. We're hopeful that that could be part of, part of the solution. Um, I can tell you that one of the things that we've seen over the last year, year and a half, as we've been pushing very hard to try to establish some sort of green premium that monetizes the absence of emissions, um, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to get US companies to just pay more when they can pay less. Mm -hmm. um, and to, you know, to ask our major auto manufacturers, for example, to, to sort of be the subsidizers of, of the change that we need to see. There is some value that inherently in the security of supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do see a little bit of a cost financial valuation of that. Um, but we have actually started looking to ways that we can apply a cost to the presence of emissions which would, of course, make the low emissions goods coming out of Latin America much more cost competitive. Mm -hmm. um, so carbon border adjustment measures are one approach to doing that. Um, I don't think the US is on, on the precipice of creating its own carbon border adjustment mechanism, but I think with the EU's mechanism in place, we, we see an example and we see other countries that are starting to follow. Um, it's a bit different from a tariff because it is specific to the manufacturing and processing choices that companies make. Mm -hmm. um, and it so it plays a little bit more into cost competitiveness in the market. So that's one tool. We've also been working very hard on standards with many um, collaborators in the region uh, to try to have mining standards that will uh, create a floor uh, for the environmental practices and labor practices of extraction that's higher um, than the floor for many of the exports that are coming out of, uh, out of China today. So that is another area where I think we have opportunity to continue to work. Um, it would be great to have many countries in the region present and proactive in the international standards organization where um, China as the, the main producer has also taken the chairpersonship for many of the committees that are setting um, the standards for mining. And so it would be really good to have more uh, international pressure um, for those standards to be put in place and improve putting a cost again on poor environmental performance and on poor labor standards uh, is certainly one way for, for the region to be more cost mm. competitive. Very good point, uh, uh, Laureen. Thank you so much for that reflection. We will definitely dive into those. And, and Paula, you mentioned 
some things that are very important, right? If we want mining companies to go and invest now in refining and other, it is sometimes already hard to go in a country and do investments in mining because the right environment has to be there. So if we want to, to do more and now attract manufacturing, those conditions definitely need to be better off, I, I would say. Anything you would like to add from the mining industry perspective, Paula? Any final reflection? I um, so I, I I'm gonna say there's one example in the region that is very impressive right now, and it's the will that the Argentine government has put into incentivizing um, new investments, large investments. Uh, the approval of the omnibus bill and the RIGI have been a game changer. And actually, one of the, the attractive um, propositions for buying Arcadium, one, of course, there's other reasons, is that there's a large footprint in Argentina that Arcadium has, and that we you know, we, we see that these new incentives give us more confidence in investing. And, um, and the conditions are there to put large amounts of money into the country. Because, you know, this, this $7 billion approximately investment is just that purchase. I mean, we will have to develop some of these projects, so it's going to bring more, more investment into Argentina. Um, I think that it is all about incentives for investments, but also raising the bar for companies that are, you know, responsible. Uh, our our uh, purpose as a company is finding better ways to provide the materials the world needs, and that includes sustainable practices, uh, social practices, working responsibly with the communities. That is the type of investment you want to attract into the region because there are other investments that may not be as responsible or sustainable. Um, and, and, you know, we, we've seen a lot of that uh, for, for many years because, you know, some, some uh, companies just have a goal and the end goal justifies the means they don't care about how they do it and so what you what the region needs to do is bring incentives bring companies that raise the bar and the practices very good thank you so much paula so with that paula laurin nelson and lucas really thank you very much for this panel i think we there is a lot of things to to dive into a lot of lots of food for thought this is not easy but I think it's worth pursuing, uh, you know, uh, even under uncertainty, there are chances for investment, as our colleagues from Bloomberg said. I think we will continue working on these areas uh, because this is something uh, we believe as a DADB have a play to role. We, as Nelson said, uh, we are seeing that and we are working with some mining industries to connect the dots between that premium, the financing, the regional cooperation angle. So thank you so much. I think I, I really enjoyed the panel. Thank you, Nelson, Lucas, uh, and our colleagues here, Laurina and Paula. Thank you very much. So you. before you. you leave the stage, we're going to take a, a group picture. So even those of you who are online, can you please smile as you will be in a picture? <laughs> no, so para, o sea, para, para, pero no los tapen. Se, ¿Se tapan o no? Sí. Or move. Sí. Marcelino, vente para acá. Come. No, no, come, come. To the side. Y, if you can move, like, to that side. Yes. <laughs> Gracias. Thank you. So. Thank you <laughs> So to send us off, I would like to invite to this panel, uh, sorry, to the stage, Natasha Nunes Acuña, who is the lead mining specialist, who will give the closing remarks. And we thank everyone uh, again for being here today and, in, and participating in this event. Hello, everyone. 
um, hello a los que nos escuchan online as well. Um, thank you for this. It's very interesting, I find, um, to hear the different perspectives from a value chain that goes down and up, and it's very complex and very and very uh, interesting and very important for our region. I think I'll just summarize a few points. I think um, it is clear that the region, Latin America and the Caribbean today, stands at a crossroads between opportunity and challenge, and they're just as one is just as big as the other. Um, this requires um, concerted efforts to build capacity, um, to strengthen, uh, when possible, uh, regional alliances and integration, and secure investments to transform potential into reality. I think that that message has been echoed uh, from the beginning to the end um, of this of this event, of this event, like Marcelino said, this is far from easy, but I think this is our key task. Uh, and as Juan Roberto said, uh, if we work with development, we must be optimistic uh, and believe that this can be achieved. Um, Latin America and the Caribbean hold immense potential. Uh, again, the potential to lead in the development of clean energy supply chains if it leverages the rich natural resources that we have, strategic location, and growing industrial capabilities. Uh, to maximize this benefit, how, uh, these benefits, however, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean must seek um, opportunities to develop refining capacity, leverage renewable energy investments, and promote local manufacturing um, as well. Again, uh, with, an, with a focus or efforts dedicated to building regional alliances as well as strong public-private initiatives uh, that can be vital to enhance competitiveness and resilience. Um, again, there are huge challenges in this, addressing market inequalities and reducing dependence on international suppliers, as has been said, requires uh, coordinated policies and investments both within the region uh, and between regions, between countries, investments in technology, infrastructure and very important as well let's not forget human capital um, formation i believe that and this is why we're here the idb partnerships uh not i i we believe that the idb partnerships are an essential component to overcome this kind of of these kinds of obstacles like infrastructure gaps scale and efficiencies and limited fiscal space so we can we should and we we and we can work together and the idb part of the idb's role is to facilitate these partnerships um Again, you know, this is not easy, et cetera, et cetera, it's so hard, but that doesn't mean that it can be done. The path forward does require that we think innovatively, uh, that we take bold action, and that we collaborate very closely, uh, not only between like-minded people, not only between um, governments, but between and among governments, businesses, development organizations, and other players that are relevant in this sector. Um, that if we do this correctly, and and part of our role is to support that this is done correctly, then we think that the, the region, Latin America and the Caribbean, can establish itself as a hub for renewable energy technologies with high quality jobs, regional development, um, and contributing meaning, meaningfully to the global fight, flat, fight against climate change, which is what drives, at the end of the day, investments in the mining sector and in clean energy uh, supply chains. So with that, I thank you. I hope that this conversation and today's uh, today's discussion has uh, or can inspire us to explore these innovative solutions and to work uh, together among the different actors to find the solutions um, to these challenges. So thank you once again for joining us. Thank you to the panelists and everyone. Gracias.